Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, joining to, to this uh, colloquium. So for me, it's a pleasure to, to introduce today's speaker, Jure uh, Zupan. Jure uh, got his PhD at the University of Ljubljana in uh, 2002. Uh, then he had several postdoc positions uh, uh, all around, including uh, at CERN. And uh, now since 10, almost a bit more than 10 years, uh, he's a faculty at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, and uh, he's a, Jure is an expert on uh, several aspects on, of uh, high energy physics, uh, uh, spanning from uh, dark matter, uh, Higgs physics, collider. Uh, uh, but his main focus, uh, I think uh, I can say that uh, is really been uh, in flavor physics uh, and the connection uh, between flavor physics and the uh, beyond solar model uh, phenomenology. Now, uh, before I leave the stage to him, let me just spend a couple of words to, to present the topic of, uh, of today's colloquium. Uh, that is a uh, flavor physics. Uh, and uh, so understanding the origin uh, of this peculiar structure that we have in uh, masses and uh, mixing of uh, quarks and leptons uh, is one of the big mysteries of the standard model, uh, so called flavor puzzle. And uh, actually, since the birth of uh, particle physics, uh, studying uh, these flavor transitions uh, uh, was uh, instrumental to, to understand the properties of uh, fundamental interactions. Uh, and uh, now, in, uh, nowadays, uh, the study of uh, these uh, rare uh, flavor transitions uh, is uh, a really powerful tool uh, to look for physics beyond the standard model and maybe to make progress in the understanding of this flavor puzzle. Uh, actually, interestingly, in the last few years, uh, we have seen uh, uh, several measurements that uh, are showing uh, some discrepancies from the standard model predictions. And this uh, got uh, large part of the community quite excited. And we had uh, also recently uh, this year uh, in the spring, uh, some, uh, some interesting updates. So uh, in this colloquium, Yure will tell us about uh, his own perspective on the, on the status of this field and uh, the interesting prospects that we can uh, expect uh, for the future. So uh, okay, without uh, going uh, even further, Yure, please uh, give the stage to you. Thank you very much for accepting. All right, thank you, David. Uh, I'm also very glad that you gave a bit longer introduction that included physics because there you also mentioned things that I will not talk about, namely the standard model flavor puzzle. So um, if I want to condense this whole field in one slide is let's say one uh, motivation is that we are observing uh, uh, matter around us. So we have baryonic asymmetry and this uh, implies that there's more CP violation that we see in the standard model. Um, now, these flavor measurements are a way to probe such uh, required new, C new CP violating sectors. Uh, so it probes both uh, either high energy scales or small couplings. And then on top of this, it will probe some other puzzles like dark matter, strong CP problems. So I'll try to now go deeper into these statements. Um, but the problem that one faces when giving uh, any seminar that or a colloquium is that first of all, there are many experiments. So I, I combined here in blue are sort of operating experiments that uh, have connection with, to flavor. The grade ones are planned experiments. And then the, in green, I also added the uh, experiments that are measuring electric dipole moments. So many experiments throughout the globe. And what this translates into is that also there are many measurements. So if I just open a PDG, a bulk of the PDG is observables that are related to flavor physics. So they're sort of an order 10 to the four observables, branching ratios, some angular distribution, CP violating asymmetries. So of course, there's no way I can uh, give uh, this field a justice. So what I'll do is our focus on the sensitivity to new physics. So there will be a selection of uh, topics where more main focus is um, obser observables or measurements that are in some way or other uh, probing new physics. All right, so the outline is, so I already gave slightly why uh, flavor physics. And then I split this into probing heavy new physics and light new physics. And then I move on to, let's say, the second part of the, the talk, which is the experimental anomalies that David also mentioned, that uh, there's a lot of excitement behind them. And uh, throughout, I will sprinkle 
um, the prospects. No? So what's next? Uh, there is a Bell 2 and LHCB upgrades. So I'll try to give you um, an impression as to how things could improve. All right, so I start with probing heavy new physics. So this is a, sort of a classic motivation for doing flavor physics. And uh, the motivation goes, or the, the observation goes as follows. So the first important observation is that in the standard model, uh, if you have exchange like processes that occur at three levels, so like a gluon exchange or a photon exchange or a Z or the Higgs, none of these processes would have flavor changing uh, transitions. So I cannot have a B quark turn into an S quark and emit a gluon. It will always have a B quark goes into a B quark. So what that uh, is, so in jargon, this means there is no flavor changing neutral currents or all FCNCs are loop suppressed. So in the standard model, you can have at one loop, for instance, a transition like this, when I take a B quark, turn it into an S quark with the virtual emission of a T and a W, and then I close the loop and I have a BS transition also here. So I will turn at the end a B quark that will turn into an S quark and an anti S quark will become an anti B quark. So uh, this will induce, for instance, meson mixing. Uh, now, the important thing is that this is now suppressed. It's suppressed uh, by a loop factor and there's also a gene suppression. So an extra suppression because of the unitarity of the mixing matrices. Uh, so the transitions are rare in the standard model. So that's a good place to search for deviations. So they can be modified by new physics. For instance, you can have a three level exchange of new physics or a one loop exchange. So X and Y are some new particles. The uh, probe uh, is uh, degenerate in couplings and masses. So the, the typical contribution, for instance, at dimension six will have um, some couplings to let's say BS squared. So on this side and on the right hand side, and it will be down by the heavy new mass scale. So if the heavy particles are very heavy, these uh, new physics contributions disappear. Or if they couple very feebly, you will also have no effects in these transitions. So all you can see is these combinations of couplings and, and masses. All right, so I said that uh, these transitions are rare. Right? It means that in terms of the new physics scale, if I assume order one couplings, the, the scales that are being probed or the masses of the, the three level exchanged particles that are very high. So let's say from K on transitions. So the flavor observables are these green ones, always assuming what couplings of order one, the scale would be, let's say 10 to the five or 10 to the six TeV. Um, there are other uh, observables, also flavor violating that are uh, with the leptons. So it's a mu to E gamma. Again, very high scales st sticking in order one coefficients. These are the, the electric dipole moments. Again, very high scales. And if you compare this, let's say with the observables at the um, LHC, of course, the scales are much lower, but you're measuring different things. And so this is virtual corrections, assuming order one couplings. So it's crucially depends on what the flavor structure is. Here you're producing either states on share, which is this direct reach or through electric precision observables. Now, another thing to note is the, uh, so the, the uh, colored part of the bar is what the reach is now. And then the midterm future, so that's roughly the end of the high Lumi LHC, is this impro expected improvement, which is uh, the, 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 the darker colored. So even on the log plot, we can see uh, the improvement in the reach. So it's, a, it's some of these experiments we really have in the, less, in the, less, in the next decade or so will greatly improve how we probe new physics. 
All right, so now, um, so let me focus now on the mixing observables. So I'll, I'll, uh, for this introductory part, I will go through a classic uh, test of a standard model in flavor physics, which is asking whether or not the CK matrix is unitary. So the CK matrix is parameterizing the charge transition. So you emit the W and let's say you turn a big quark to an up quark. The strength of this transition is controlled by a mixing matrix V of B. Now I have three down quarks and three up quarks. So this uh, this whole tr this whole transition is then specified by a three by three matrix, which is unitary. It comes from the diagonalization of the mass matrices. The entries are hierarchical, so the bigger the bigger elements are on the diagonal, and further away you go, the smaller they are. So that's represented with the circle. So VOB is much much smaller than let's say VTB. Now. Um, the unitarity of the mass matrix of the mixing matrix, you can uh, probe by doing the following. Now, so I take let's say the first column, and I multiply with the conjugated third column. Since the CK matrix is unitary, well, this product should add up to zero. So the sum of these uh, products should add up to zero, which we can denote in the complex plane. So let's say that you normalize everything with this VCD, VCB. So that will be, you just uh, rotate the triangle such that this VCD, VCB direction is one zero. Uh, if, and, and then the rest, this the, the other two sides are the length of VOD, VOB normalized and the length of VTD, VTB side normalized. So if the CKM matrix is unitary, all the measurements should coalesce and be described now by only two parameters, which is the apex of this triangle. So the rho bar and eta bar is the xy position of this apex. I should also say that uh, the, uh, the surface of this triangle is proportional to the size of the CP violation that we have in the standard model. So if, if this uh, surface area is if the area is zero, there is no CP violation. All right, so now we have all we need to see how the, the constraints improved. Now, the players in this field were, uh, the big change was when the B factory started. So this, they ran, so Bell and Babar were two experiments uh, that ran in the 2000s. Bell was situated in Tsukuba, Japan. The bar was in uh, Slack, uh, California, and they each of them collected about uh, a billion uh, B mesons. Now the super B factories are um, what are, are LACB, which is an experiment running at CERN, which is running right now, and it will run probably until the, the some until some sometime in 2030s. And the, 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 they will end, end up collecting about two more orders of magnitude more useful bees. The same for Bell, Bell 2, which is running now. Maybe 2018 is when they started the, 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 the engineering runs. So again, 10 to the 11 B mesons. So two orders of magnitude more. Another way of saying this is that the B physics is experience uh, deflation. It's a good deflation. So if you ask about how much it costs to produce one B meson, uh, just uh, looking at the electricity costs, so somebody hands you the detector and the, the, the collider for free, it was about 50 cents per B meson. Uh, in now, no, with Bell 2 and LHCB running, this uh, is below a cent. For B mesons, so it's good. We have much more B mesons. We can make more precise predictions. Uh, so let's go back to this uh, unitarity triangle. In '95, before the B factory switched on, um, you see there were a few measurements that were on the market. These different colors represent different measurements, and the shaded area is 
where the apex of the triangle was uh, allowed to be. No? So this was this unitarity triangle. Everything looked kind of okay, but with huge error bars. And then the as soon as the B factor is switched on, so first of all, you see that there are many more uh, observables happen, uh, being measured. So 2009, you see more colors and the measurements all are coinciding. So you see this region where the apex can be given all the measurements is becoming smaller and smaller. So 2019, there's even more measurements. So let me just go very quickly over what these measurements are. So this band here comes from KK bar mixing. So you convert S and D anti B quark to D S bar. The rest are from B physics. So either BB bar mixing, which are these two measurements here, or the B sub S mixing, so B and S quark. And then there are others, which are instead of having loops, they can be induced that they are induced at three levels. So let's say you take a B to a U quark, and then you measure this VUB matrix element. So that's this measurement here. Or let's say some more complicated three level diagram where you take a B quark and it converts to a C quark. Now, the details are not very important. The important thing is that there are very different transitions at the quark level. And even so that all these measurements are coinciding and pointing to a coherent picture. In all these are now described by just two parameters, which is this apex of the, of the, the uh, standard unitarity triangle. So in other words, this description of the standard model where we have a CKM matrix element, uh, CKM uh, matrix that is unitary works well within errors. So let's say maybe at the level of 10 to 20%. All right, so what's next? Um, let me show uh, the same thing now, but uh, uh, circling back to what scales are being probed. So I showed the constraints on what was plotted in the first uh, um, uh, figure ahead was a constraint on the new physics where uh, I switched on just one dimension six operator. So this would induce BB bar mixing. That's the the red column here and the improvements from 2007 to now is also visible in the this log plot so this in the last 15 years you know on the log plot you can see the improvements different colors are different systems b sub s b sub d or d mixing oops sorry and the this different c1 c2 c3 columns are different chiralities. So it depends what type of new physics you have. Uh, the reach can be bigger or smaller just because the, the chirality is different. All right, so, so far, you know, we had log, uh, log in, so exponential improvements. What's gonna happen next is, let's say, just look at the LHCB now. And then going into the future, that's the first phase. That's the phase that uh, is gonna start after the LHC restarts. You see that the, I mean, it's quite uh, uh, an impressive improvement. Now, now I have to blow up this region where, uh, where um, you see the constraints. And then going even further, no, I mean, now it's becoming ridiculous to plot the whole plane. And even in this blow, blown up region, uh, you see very precise measurement. So this is at the end of high LUMI uh, uh, LHC. And these constraints were shown, these were these bands, the, the, the grayed out bands that were shown in the first figure. Okay, so that's the jump. So clearly there is a lot of sensitivity to uh, improve uh, the reach. All right, so that's all I wanted to say about the this, the, the searching for heavy new physics, the introductory part. So now let me switch uh, to the light new physics. This will be very brief, but I just wanted to point out that that's not all what uh, this, uh, that high new physics is not all the these observables are useful for. So if you have a light new physics particle, 
it can be produced on shares. It can be produced in a rare process like uh, this. So you take a quark of one flavor, convert it into a different flavor, and you emit um, this light new physics guy. This is, uh, so conversion of the, the flavor is useful because again, it's gonna be a very rare process in the standard model or maybe even non-existent and you can search for such transitions. The same thing with the leptons. No? We can go muon to electron plus emitting a light guy. All right, so how can new physics be light? Well, the first thing that maybe comes to mind is that if you have a spontaneously broken global symmetry, or U1, or there will be a light associated a number Goldstone boson. So just writing out an affecting Lagrangian from the low energy, uh, you see that the interactions with the standard model need to start at dimension five. No? So I have to have a derivative coupling to the standard model currents because this is a number Goldstone boson. So it has a shift symmetry. So this preserves the shift symmetry. Uh, and it couples to the uh, fermionic currents, either the, the vector or a pseudoscalar. It depends on the charge assignments of this global U1. In addition, you can also have the terms that are, um, that are, um, that would arise due to the anomaly. So if the U1 is anomalous, then you would also have couplings to the photons or the gluons uh, also generated, uh, so they're also of dimension five. No? So FA is the heavy scale. Um, for instance, it would be the, the, the axion decay constant if A is the QCD axion. All right, so for our purposes, the important thing is that these couplings uh, to standard model fermions can be of diagonal can have flavor violating couplings. So this would happen if the U1 is not universal. It distinguishes between first and second and the third generation, right? Now, what we will see is that since these are dimension five operators, unlike what I was showing before, the scale of new physics that is being probed is very high. So it will be, it can be even higher than the astrophysical bounds. So what I will show now is the constraints in terms of what are called capital F. So instead of using the small f, I absorb the coupling constants into the definition. So small coupling constants will mean a bigger scale capital F. So if all the coupling constants are of the or of order one, then FA is the same as the capital F that I will show. Now, if you want to have some concrete examples of these uh, number Goldstone bosons, for instance, this could be the QCD axion that has fly flavor violating couplings or uh, an oxyflame, and so uh, a number Goldstone boson that is associated with uh, flavor symmetry, or a myron, so with the, uh, would be associated to the breaking of the lepton number. All right, so what I will show is the constraints for a flavor violating QCD axion. So this can so solve a strong CP problem. And the present bounds come from this, the flavor violating transition. So let's say I can have an S quark decays to a D quark and you emit an axion. And this axion is, if it's a QCD axion, it's very light. It escapes the detector. So in the detector, you just see invisible energy. Now what's shown here is this scale, this capital F scale uh, that is um, probed right now. And you see that the scales are very high. So it's 10 to the 12 GeV. While uh, for dimension six, so when you had heavy new physics, the scales were maybe 10 to the nine. So three orders of magnitude smaller. And furthermore, there will be a, a, a big jump in the improvement. Well, there are also, um, oops, sorry. There are also 
uh, for the comparison, I, I'm showing the bounds that come from the astrophysics. So for instance, you could have a cooling of stars. And you see that if you have this flavor violating couplings, uh, this, this, um, the sensitivity is much bigger. In other words, it's, it's quite possible that you could uh, observe a QCD axion in this flavor violating the case. Of course, it depends on what is happening at the high scale, what exactly the model is. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is that the bounds depend on exactly what the flavor transitions are. So that's these different colorings. No? You see that there are different uh, transitions, either vector or axial. So, okay, so then we get into details, know exactly which, uh, which decay mode you have to look for. And the, uh, the lighter uh, shades are telling me how much the experiments can improve the reach. Uh, if you see a very big jump like uh, here, B to row A, it's because it has not been searched for. So there are blind spots where just, you know, um, doing the analysis, you have a good chance of discovering something. All right, so this was a, a very quick uh, motivation of, of um, the, both the searching for heavy new physics and light new physics. So I think what uh, you want to remember out of this is that these are very sensitive probes uh, in many cases, much more sensitive than anything else that we have in our toolbox. It depends on the details, of course, but it may not come as a surprise that you would start seeing some experimental anomalies in these types of transitions. All right, so now I will switch to the, will uh, switch gears a little bit and I will talk about the experimental anomalies. All right, so, I stole this uh, figure from uh, Patrick Koppenberg. Mm -hmm. So what's shown here is there's um, a series of different observables. All of these up here, no, so up, up to here, so up, sorry, up to the muon G minus two, they involve muons. And then there are uh, three that involve taus. So there are anomalies here. The anomaly is that the standard model prediction, so this is all normalized to the standard model prediction, with the errors, that's these uh, lines here, give you the standard model theory error. The measurements, which are in blue, again, normalized to the standard model uh, prediction, the central value, they are, you see that in some cases, they are quite far away from where they should be. So the anomalies are the fact that I have the, the blue measurements away from the um, zero. It's all normalized in terms of sigmas. No? So this would be a three sigma uh, deviation. Uh, another thing that you want to, uh, so first of all, you know, there, there are three sigma, four sigma-ish um, uh, deviations. We'll go over them. Uh, what I also want to point out is that there are a few observables where the theory errors are very small. For instance, this guy here, another one here, the theory errors are very small. Uh, for instance, uh, let's say this guy, no, the theory errors are very small. So this is what I will call clean observables. And in some of those, let's say here, the error bar is small. In those, in some of those, also the experiment is quite far. Maybe, maybe the errors are big, but they can be reduced in the future. All right, so that's that's why uh, this is a very exciting, uh, um, let's say, possibility. You know, we, we can improve, and the the measurements are disagreeing in the observables that are clean theoretically. All right, so there were so two news in the last two months. So the first one was with uh, about the R sub K observable uh, that went from 2.5 sigma to 3.1 sigma. Okay, I will introduce this observable later, but there, there was this one observable. So this was the first single measurement in the so-called B anomalies that crossed the evidence threshold. The evidence threshold 
is sociologically put at the level of three sigma, uh, while the observation is five sigma deviation. And then the G minus two of the muon observable went from 3.7 sigma to 4.2 sigma uh, was announcement last month. All right, so I think we're somewhere here where we have uh, some three sigma-ish um, anomalies chipping away at the huge uh, shipment, uh, a huge ship, which is the standard model. You know? uh, there are many measurements that have been done in the past. Most of them or all of them agree with the standard model. However, there's this maybe coherent uh, picture or of three sigma anomalies that might be uh, changing the situation. No? We would not be stuck with the standard model anymore. So let's see what's going on. All right, so let's just say that this is new physics. So if it's new physics, uh, these observables that I, I showed, they were of three types. So the first two types involve the B quarks. So they were either a B quark changing to a, a charm plus a tau and a neutrino. So this is mediated in the standard model uh, through a W. Then another set of transitions was a flavor changing neutral current transition. We had a B quark converting to an S quark. And then uh, there is a pair of muons or leptons. Now, so these two quark level transitions, they are showing sort of four sigma deviations each, uh, if you combine the observables. So, uh, there's a wiggle here, so three to five. Um, and they're explainable with new physics. For instance, if, we, if I take this to be V minus A quark currents and ask about the suppression, so the suppression scale with order one coefficient, this is the V minus A current. So I take a B to S for instance, in a mu plus V minus pair. Then for the B to C tau new anomaly, the scale of new physics suppression is three TV. If you look at the B to S mu plus mu minus, this lambda new physics is 40 TV, right? So high scale and low scale, of course, these are apparent scales because I set the coefficient here to be one. If the coefficient upstairs, so the couplings are smaller, then you have to rescale uh, the new physics mass. So this, the mass would also need to be smaller. Now there was the third type, which is the G minus two uh, observables. Uh, we, had, we showed 4.2 sigma deviation from the standard model. In the effect standard model effective theory, this observable is just a dimension six operator. So it takes, let's say a muon, a right-handed muon to a left-handed muon, and you spit off a photon. Uh, I, here in the normalization, I included the Higgs wave because we have a correlative flipping. Uh, then the, it's down by lambda ij and also included the loop factor because in the standard model, let's say in the new physics, it will be generated uh, through a loop. So if this is mu g minus two of the muon, the scale is 15 TeV. And this is much, much smaller than for instance, some other transitions where you change flavor. For instance, you could have mu to electron and a photon. Then the scale is, the bound on the scale is enormous. It's 3000 TVs. So what does this tell me is that if this is due to new physics, it also has to have uh, a, a very a peculiar um, flavor structure such that you suppress this of diagonal transitions. So it's good you couple two muons, but you should not couple two muons and electrons at the same time or very feebly. All right, so now the rest of the talk is really gonna be just about these anomalies. So what I'll do is I'll go a bit deeper. So I'll, I'll talk briefly about the experiments and then the, uh, the explanations in terms of the new physics. So there will be 
the G minus two of the muon, then I will switch to this transition B to S mu plus mu minus, and then finally to B to C tau nu. And then if time permits, I'll have a few slides about the sort of, could you explain this in, a, in some coherent uh, model? All right, so I start with the first one. So G minus two of the muon. All right, so the first question is, are we seeing a deviation? So in the standard model, this comes from the QED corrections, uh, the electroweak corrections, and then the, the, the uh, sorry, at the, so the, the QCD part. Uh, so the first thing to see now is that A, uh, there are many numbers here, you know, so this observable is very precisely known in, the, known in the standard model. The QED corrections are known to uh, five loops. Uh, the uh, error bar is 43 times 10 to the minus, in, in units of 10 to the minus 10, is dominated by, so here I, I stole this from the muon G minus two uh, theory initiative. So this is different contributions to the G minus two observables coming either from QED with a very small error uh, uh, from the electroweak, again, very small error. So the dot here is, uh, the dot here is the 10, 10 to the minus 10. It's maybe hard to see, no? So this is below well below the, 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 the error bars. There's this hadronic vacuum polarization, which has an error of 40 in units of 10 to the minus 10. So that's the bulk of the theory error. Right, so where is, does this come from? I have a muon coupling to a photon and there's a radiative correction where you have uh, QCD stuff. So hadrons inside this blob. So that's the main contribution. You have a photon, couples to the muon, there's a radiative correction, there are hadrons uh, off shell in this uh, blob, and then you couple back to the muon. So this is, since QCD is non-perturbative, this is where the errors may be. You know? All right, so, and the, here I also showed the experimental versus the standard model prediction so in units of 10 to the minus 10, this is 250. So you see roughly five times bigger than the error no? uh, with uh, the combined error of 59. No? So it's also the experimental and the theory error are comparable. No? So it's really the question about how well are we controlling the theory, not just the experiment. Now, um, so I have a few more words about how well we know this hadronic vacuum polarization. So again, the contribution is I have a muon, you spit off a photon, and then you have a QQ bar uh, loop. No? That would be the perturbative picture. This is not the correct one because this is at low energies. So I have hadronized uh, uh, contribution. There will be hadrons, non-perturbative uh, contribution. So there are two ways of um, predicting this. One is experiment driven, which is you take um, experimental measurements for a, a, a radiative production of hadrons. These are these R ratios. That's the prediction here. Again, in units of 10 to the minus 10. What's above the line are uh, predictions using numerical methods. So lattice QCD, so you discretize uh, space-time and you, and you evaluate this hadronic contribution. So these are different collaborations, have different predictions. There is one that sticks out, which has very small errors and lies away, away from uh, the, the R ratio. Uh, so this R ratio prediction. What's the difference between the left and the right plot is that this BMW prediction uh, was, uh, this was from preprint. This is now a published 
uh, nature published work and the shaded region is where you agree with the experiment. So it, it moved, um, this where you agree with the experiment is not shown here. Right? So it moved by one sigma to the, where you have no new physics, the R ratios are here, right? All right, so maybe this was too much details. Uh, so let me just recap. There are two ways of uh, of uh, determining what the R ratio is, completely experiment driven. This is where the 4.2 sigma deviation comes from, claim of 4.2 sigma deviation comes from. Uh, so this is uh, minimal theory input, just uh, re, re interpreting other experiments. There is a direct theory prediction they are basically all over the place. And there is one interesting one with claimed small error bars that needs to be checked. And if it is right, there is no new physics. So the situation is not entirely clear, but there's something, something funny going on. Uh, not everybody can be right, that's for sure. All right, so let's say that this, uh, uh, experiment driven determinations are correct, then we have a four plus sigma deviation and we need to explain it outside the standard model. So if, if you are looking at new physics, there are sort of two types of uh, explanations. They differ qualitatively uh, in the following way. So in both cases, you need to have a muon coupling to stuff that runs in the loop, and then you emit a photon somewhere. So it couples to one of the internal lines. The two types of the of new physics explanations differ by where the correlity uh, uh, flip comes from. So this takes a right-handed and converts it to a left-handed muon. That's the same as making a mass insertion, for instance, on the external line. So that's the first option is that this correlative flip comes from the muon itself. So it's suppressed by the muon mass. Therefore, the new physics needs to be light. So for instance, you can imagine that we have a gauge boson, a new gauge boson that is a gauged uh, leptonic mu muon number minus leptonic tau number. So you gauge the second and the third generation with exactly the opposite charges, the second and the third generation of leptons. There is a connected gauge boson, which is needs to be light. That's the green band here that explains G minus two of the muon. And you see that the mass of this Z prime needs to be sort of a hundred MeV very light. The coupling constant is also very small, a uh, few times 10 to the minus four. So this is much smaller than the weak coupling constant, which is 0.6 or so. So it's generated at one loop. It couples to muon. You emit a photon by uh, from this loop and it can compete uh, it can uh, change the prediction of G minus two by the right amount if the coupling is small. Now, the other option is that these heavy states themselves couple to the Higgs so that the correlative flip occurs on the uh, internal lines. So then this Coupling to the Higgs does not have to be suppressed by the muon mass, no? it can be a large number. And in this case, the new physics can be heavy. So what I will show you is a particular example where uh, what's running in the loop is a dark matter plus a, some uh, charged states. No? So just visually, so that's the, there are a doublet and the siglet, there are fermions, so a singlet of the standard model gauge group, a doublet of the standard model gauge group. 
you see that they are sort of a 2 TV. That's the green band explains the G minus two. Uh, since this was dark matter, you get the right, right correct relic abundance on these red lines. So these red lines give you exactly the right relic abundance. Uh, while the direct detection excludes this orange band. So there are region, let's say here, you know, where you would have the right dark matter relic abundance, explain the G minus two, and the new physics states are at three to four TeV. The direct searches are uh, much less sensitive. So the LHC searches are, that's this excluded region here, are below a TeV because these are electroweak states. All right. Okay, so so that's all I wanted to say about the G minus two of the muon. Now we move on to the the B anomalies. So the first one was the B to S mu plus mu minus. So the upshot here is there are theoretically clean observables. I pointed out a few of them. If you combine uh, just these. So there's basically no theory uncertainty. We have a five sigma axis. So that's very exciting. The, it's, it gets even better because there are many other observables uh, and uh, this deviation is consistent with having, um, there are smaller deviations, but nevertheless, so it's consistent with those deviations. And it, the interpretation can be with uh, points to relatively high new physics scale. So there are less constraints by direct uh, probes, right? So now I'll go a little bit more into the details. I will just show you what you get by considering just the theoretically clean observables. So, um, so all these observables uh, rely on the following. So we said that this B to S mu plus mu minus transition is generated at one loop. So it's highly suppressed. Um, the, it, it, the, the standard model matches onto a dimension six operator. There will be only two that will be relevant for us. So I have a left-handed current on the quark side. So that's this BL that converts to a strange quark. And then on the leptonic side, you either have a vector or an axial vector. So the C9 will have a vector. C9 is the coefficient, the dimensionless coefficient that sits in front. And then the rest are, that's the Fermi constant. It's uh, 10 to the minus five GV to the minus two. This is the CKM suppression that you have in the standard model times the loop factor because it's uh, at a loop factor in, generated as a loop factor in the standard model. So through these penguin and box diagrams. And in the standard model, accidentally, numerically, the vector C9 and the axial have uh, opposite sign, roughly. Uh, the most important thing is that whether or not you have an electron or a muon, uh, you will get the same result in the standard model. No? The Z and the photon don't distinguish between the, the leptons. The W doesn't distinguish between the leptons. All the, 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 um, the difference sits in the masses. The muon and the electron are relatively light, much lighter than the B mesons. So to first approximation, you can just ignore those. In other words, in the standard model, we expect lepton flavor universality. So a transition B to S E plus E minus should occur at the same rate as the B to S mu plus mu minus. All right, so this already tells us what are the good observables. So let's form ratios. So that's, I take a B quark and I convert it to an S quarks. So now these quarks are hadronized, they're inside hadrons. So it means that I take a B meson and I either end up with a K on, so a pseudoscalar meson or a K star, a vector meson. So K or K star contain a strange quark, B meson contains a B quark. 
and then you form a ratio of the muon final state over the e plus e minus final state. Um, the, 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 the measurement is done for a particular mass of the invariant mass squared of the lepton pair that is flying out. So that's this blue region here. So you integrate out over the invariant mass of this mu plus mu minus pair. So that's where the measurement is. You don't measure over the whole range because there are resonances up here. So you want to stay below the resonances. That's the measurement. So the measurement is sits here. That's the LHCB measurement. Standard model is this one. No, the ratio should be one. There's lepton flavor universality. And these are previous measurements with much poorer error bars. So that's the anomaly, no? the fact that the, the measurement is below one. For RK star, there are two bins, but otherwise the, the, the rest is basically the same. No? So there are two measurements now, two bins in the invariant mass. These are the measurements. And this would be the predictions. The predictions here are below one because you are near the threshold and you start uh, seeing that the muon is not massless. All right, so uh, there's another important uh, precise, um, so uh, it's a clean observable, which is just the branching ratio of B meson decaying to directly muon uh, pairs. So either a B sub S, which is here, or a B sub D. So either you have a B quark and an S quark inside the meson or a B E quark and a D quark inside the meson. So what's plotted here is the standard model prediction. So it has, you don't even see the, 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 the error bars in the B sub D system, but a very small error in B sub S system. And then the measurements that come from three different LHC experiments. The LHCB is this dash line. These are three sigma contours, CMS, is the red one and atlas is the green one. So the combined significance, one sigma, two sigma, and three sigma are these uh, uh, ellipses here. So you see that the measurements, the combined measurements sit about two sigma uh, below the, the, uh, the standard model prediction. Now we can convert these clean observables or clean measurements, no theory error, into the constraints onto these two Wilson coefficients, right? So sort of order one is, or it's an order a few, is the value of the standard model, no? order a few. Uh, um, that's the deviation from the standard model, the deviation in the C10 and C9, no? coupling to muons. So this was, for a vector current muons, axial vector current uh, for the muons. The combined constraints are here. So that's the, the five sigma contour, the three sigma, the one sigma is the orange. And you see the improvements from 2017 where the three sigma is this dashed line the colorful stuff in the background are separate measurements. And so A, they agree with each other and you see that it's away from zero. So the standard model is this zero, zero. So Delta C equals zero means no deviation. So we're five Sigma away from, from the standard model, just using the clean observables. All right, so if this is new physics, so what could it be? Um, so let me assume that this is new physics. Uh, the scale is uh, 36 TeV. No? If the new physics coefficient that sits on top is order one, which is what we were seeing. So that tells me that there's, uh, the scale is quite high. So you can either have new physics that comes from the three level exchanges or loop level exchanges. So the three level exchanges are of two types is either you couple to quarks and lepton separately 
so this would be sort of a Z prime uh, that runs at a tree level, or you convert a B quark to a muon, and then you have a lepto quark exchange. So the um, the challenge with the Z prime is that since you have a three level coupling that is flavor changing, that changes B to S, then you will generate the mixing. And furthermore, since these are couplings to left handed muons, uh, necessarily you also have the, the constraints where uh, you have a neutrino beam scattering on the nucleus through the Z prime exchange. It generates the mu plus mu minus pair. So that's what's plotted here is everything to the right, uh, sorry, to the left here, that is so this red region is excluded by this type of transitions. The grade one, the grade out region is excluded by this sub S mixing. And the, the, the blue, uh, sorry, the, uh, this uh, white region is where you can explain the anomaly, right? So everything was here fixed such that you explain the anomaly. That's the mass of the Z prime versus the coupling. Uh, the, that's uh, for uh, this L mu minus L tau uh, gauge, gauged uh, version. So there's a big, I would say it's a big uh, region where this is fine, but it goes uh, sort of electroweak uh, scale. So GeV to a TeV with couplings that go that are sort of order one-ish for the muons. The other option is this leptoquarks. Uh, here, all I wanted to show is that uh, there is an upper bound. Uh, it arises because you have a constraint that comes from vis -vis mixing. So that's this blue band while the, uh, so, so that comes from the mixing. As the blue band, uh, while the uh, the the anomaly is is explained by the three level exchange, so it cannot be too heavy, depending on what exactly the lepto quark is. You know, it's forty or twenty TV or so. All right, so I said that you can also do it with loops. It's tough because the scale is lower. So basically, you are really in tension with direct searches. Um, so. I will go over the, the beast to sit down you very quickly. And I think I will just give you a, a gist of what a combined explanation will be. And then I will conclude because I think I will, otherwise I will go over time by too much. So for the B to sit down you, uh, the upshot is, okay, it's theoretically clean. However, in the standard model, like the exchange is that it, it, this is a generated from the W exchange. It's a three level. So the new physics effect is large and everything runs from here. No, it's in conflict with other constraints. So you're very constrained. The other thing to note is the experiment uh, looks like this. So it's the ratio. So tau nu versus L nu. So tau versus all the other leptons. The experiment is here. The standard model prediction is very small. So these are the two observables, either a D or a D star. The ellipses here are, are measurements, different measurements from Babar, Bell at 15, uh, 2015, Bell at 2019. So it's very interesting to see what was happening with the, as a function of when the measurement was done. The, uh, the magenta is where the standard model is. And you see that there is a tendency of a regression toward mean or the standard model. At the, if you, okay, this is completely sociological. No, I don't know what is happening, but it is true that the deviation is being dominated by odd measurements. Doesn't mean that it's gone, but you know, take it or leave it, I would say. Um, so I say the big effect, it's really hard. So you would, the, 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 there are two types of exchanges like a W prime or a charge Higgs or the lepto quarks. And the problem is that these obvious candidates are just ruled out, no? Like the first thing you would think it's a charge Higgs. Uh, this has many problems. It's excluded by many other uh, observations, uh, uh, searches, W prime, the same story. 
So you're left with left of quarks. And some of them are, are also ruled out. All right, so I said that I will say a few words about the grain view and then I'll stop. I will skip quite, uh, I will skip a few slides. So I think the question here is what you want, no? Is um, there's a saying that if you explain all the anomalies for sure your theory is wrong. So you can maybe attempt to uh, um, explain two. So that's where um, there is a lot of work, including uh, some of the organizers have uh, done some excellent work here. Uh, you're driven to a sort of a lepto quark with some UV realizations that may or may not have uh, so solved some other problems. Uh, I would say that if you're trying to explain RK star and G minus two, this at present is maybe a little bit more ad hoc. Okay, it's possible to explain it, but you don't really try or people have not tried to address uh, why, no? why, why this happened. And then of course you can also try to combine everything. So um, the, if you try to explain RD and RDK star, there's only one that has the checks you know, everywhere. There's one left of quark. And what this drives you toward, I will skip this, uh, I will skip this, is um, the following. So that's this lepto quark that would sit in the gauge group that is in, in the Pati Salam unification. And uh, what um, a nice observation is that you can tweak it. This is the 4321 model. You can tweak it so that you uh, treat the second and the third generation differently. Uh, the SU4 has quarks and a lepton as the, uh, as, the, as the fourth color. So you nicely combine quarks and leptons and you get the, the lepto quark uh, uh, naturally. Um, all right, so I think I, I cannot spend much time about it, uh, on this. So let me just conclude. Uh, so what I try to argue is that in the first part of the talk is that this flavor change in nuclear currents are very sensitive probes of new physics. So um, this kind of prepared us to understand that we're seeing these anomalies uh, in the processes with the muons, especially G minus two and the RK, RK star. And it's maybe not surprising that this would be the, the first place where the, the deviations would uh, happen. And the question that remains is whether we're really seeing evidence of new physics. I skipped over the last slide, but there are many measurements that can be done by many different experiments. So if this is true, we should really expect uh, many more observables to start now showing deviations from the standard model. Thank you very much. Uh... Yeah, a very, very nice talk, uh, uh, overview on the, this topic. Uh, um, so uh, if there are questions, so we can open the floor for a discussion. You can raise the hand. Uh, yes, so we have uh, Tanya Robbins. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, very good. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, can you go back to this uh, slide where you compare possible uh, explanations of various, or well, I think one beyond, uh, even before, I don't have the, yeah, this one. Okay. Um, all right. So maybe you said it and I missed it. I mean, what would be the next, uh, let's say, time-wise feasible uh, step to test any of these at least double explanations so this uh, mm. network quarks or yeah you said the last one there's no reference so is there any no, there's no reference i i there, yeah okay uh it's also i was scared to do this uh, slide because i mean i mean i omitted so many people that uh, <laughs> no, you know that's that's the problem there are there are um I mean, some of them, I, I mean, I put one example in the back of slide. But I think more importantly, I think is your first question. Or how, how can be, we be sure that we're really seeing something? Um, I didn't stress this. Uh, I think that the, the uncomfortable uh, 
thing, or I would say that the thing that makes you uh, pause a little bit is that the um, the RK, RK star measurements are driven by one experiment. It's LHCB. Now, of course, that means that, you know, it's, uh, they spend so much time understanding that what they're giving us is, of course, um, you know, that there are no systematics that they can possibly identify. So this is years in the making. Um, I don't have the timeline, but uh, these first anomalies were um, in, in the B2S MUMU are about five years, uh, started about five years ago. Uh, not with the clean observables, but, and it slowly grew in, uh, in significance, right? So, so the story is slightly different than the RDRD star where the significance is kind of staying and is dominated by the odd measurements. So the first thing you would want to see you now is that uh, Bell 2 finds exactly the same thing. Now I think then after this, everybody will start believing that this is real. Uh, you know, it's five sigma, but it's five sigma from one experiment and you know, they're doing a great job, but you never know. I mean, you never know. Mm. Uh, the other thing is maybe is that now within models, um, you can also start seeing um, onshore production. So I, I didn't show this, but for instance, you could have a production of the uh, of these leptoquarks at the at the LHC. So that's this um, gray band here. That's the the region. This is all within um, this. Uh, simplified U1 model. So it's just U1 leptoquark. Uh, there's tau tau production or direct pair production of, uh, of U1s. So you see that you're encroaching uh, uh, in, in this region. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that there also, if you uh, uh, look at this 4321 model, there is the color on here, and then there's an extra Z prime. The color and especially uh, is, um, I mean, that's where the most severe bounds come from. I think I have it here now. So uh, depending on what the, the, the width is, you know, you're looking at maybe four, four TV already. So you expect a deviation. Uh, now, the, okay, the color on uh, depends on this uh, UV realization, but um, I think it's quite generic now that you end up with uh, this color. Well, this is even with current data, if I see it correct. This is current data, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is 72 in the TT bar. Um, yeah. Okay, so one could check mm -hmm. it now. Yeah, no, no, that's absolutely true. No, mm -hmm. uh, is the the, uh, the thing is that you don't have a no lose. Um, option here in this particular anomalies because you see the scale is really 40 TV, you know, so you can just put in a, a Z prime there sits at a relatively high scale, you will not probe it completely with FCC. No. Okay. But there are, you know, indirectly you have so many things that should happen, no? this is real. First of all, Be Belton needs to measure uh, deviation. No? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Benjamin Greenstein. Hi, thank you. So I want to go back to G minus um, yes. two. And uh, uh, well, first I, I have um, uh, just, well, it's actually two questions. One is, uh, you already mentioned uh, in the case of flavor anomalies that to really get convinced you want verification from some other experiment, which has different set of um, uh, uh, uncertainties or systematic uncertainties um, and, and sees the same deviation. Uh, uh, and and uh, you can make exactly the same argument about G minus two, there's only one experiment. Uh, uh, you can't argue that the Brookhaven experiment is different from the uh, Fermilab experiment because it's the same machine and actually very much the same uh, people that are involved. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I, I know that that there is plans, I guess, to 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 measure it uh, at uh, in Japan at KK. But my yeah. so my first yeah. question is, what, what what's the status of that? Yeah. And my, my second question is actually on this slide that you put on. Uh, so my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, these four point two sigma 
deviation that is quoted and advertised in the New York Times and all of that comes from the average of these three red dots, the R ratio on that mm -hmm. slide, mm -hmm. and completely ignores all of the green uh, determinations which are from the lattice. Uh, my question is, what happens if we do the reverse? If we only take the lattice determinations and ignore the R ratio, which is data driven, and I don't understand exactly how that works. Uh, um, is, 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 would that be a fair thing to do? Or what happens if you combine everything? What is the size of the deviation? Because you know that would be the first thing to do, I guess, to have all of the information you have and combine it. Those are my two right. questions. Yeah, so, so the first one about the, um... I forgot the collaboration, but there, yeah, there's definitely plans in, in uh, KK. And I try to understand, uh, um, I should have asked around now, but I try to understand just by searching. Um, it seems, uh, I, I, okay, I think that it's very serious that this will happen. No? Uh, there are um, at some stage of approval. No? So it's pretty, I think this is pretty good. No, There will be, I would say it's relatively safe to assume there will be a G minus two measurement by a different set of people. Um, you know, I mean, the G minus two collaboration, they are, it's obvious that they are aware of the problem that there is an overlap of senior people. There are many people that were not involved, but right. it's true that many senior people were involved. And it's really a, see what they wanted to do to make sure that they don't bias themselves. Now, all this thing with the, the secret frequency that is not revealed to them. I think that's, you know, it's uh, clearly they're trying to do the best they can, but you're right. Until somebody else remeasure this, uh, you cannot, I mean, it's, it's kind of a different experiment, but not entirely, you know, as you say, you, know, you can always worry. Uh, they did improve on the systematics also. Uh, it's, um, uh, yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's, I'm not, I, I'm kind of, okay, this is again, my opinion. I'm kind of less worried about the G minus two <laughs> measurement than I am about the LHCB because, um, you know, I mean, there is a clear systematic that maybe I, I you know, we understand as this, you know, that they, they have to collect back the photons, uh, that the, the electrons emit uh, photons uh, much more than the muons, the brain off, and they have to collect them back. It's fantastic that they have this JPSI uh, measurement, you know? so clearly they know what's happening. But when you go to a smaller, um, mass squared, uh, so the, of the mu plus mu minus, maybe, I don't know, maybe there's something happening there. The nice thing is that they plan to do this with a phi final state. So phi goes to mu plus mu minus, e plus e minus. So this would be also a crucial check by LHCB themselves. Now I think this again would just um, be, uh, raise confidence, no? It's not, it's not, I'm not saying that they're doing something wrong. I mean, of course, they, they thought about many more things that they could possibly do. Um, but uh, I think even maybe even before Bell 2 comes along, they might uh, show us uh, more measurements that would be very convincing. Uh, for this, um, the hadronic vacuum polarization, um, again, okay, so these are my interpretations by trying, by talking to Ida really helped me understand Ida and Kadra, uh, what's going on is, uh, I think it's quite uh, fair to say that the um, lattice measurements are not mature enough. There are, there's, there's a, at least to me, this was quite striking. There, there's this uh, measurement of what's called AMU window where they uh, limit the the um, the q squared, so the in the integral, to the region where you are most confident that you don't have neither the uh, um, the the uh, the lattice spacing effects or the volume effects. Um, the like the, the error bars 
on the different uh, lattice measurements like these guys here. No, it's not the same collaborations that are shown here. No, but these huge error bars shrink and they don't lie on top of each other. No? So now um, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, it really needs more work. No? So I'm not sure you should combine uh, the lattice. I mean, of course, BMW quote very small errors and they might be right. No? But you would need, I think, another, uh, um, another, another, another measurement. At least the AMU, uh, this AMU window should uh, be uh, should lie on top of each other. No? Uh, for the uh, the R ratio is a different story, no? Because the the Clio and um, the bar data they don't really agree. No, they are I think about two percent off. Um, and then, um, you know, you, they, they, so my understanding is very, very naive understanding that I have is they, they, uh, the um, dispersion relation um, people, so people that do these dispersion relations, they really want to do a decision, but do something that um, uh, makes sense. No? So I, I think they, uh, inflate the errors roughly according to P the PDG. They need to keep the correlations. No? And it's possible that by doing this, now you are uh, maybe fooling yourself. No? Maybe, maybe these est estimates of the systematics are not right. Um, so also this R ratio maybe, I, I don't know. I mean, of course you do, uh, you know, so there's no way I, I can, as an outsider, you know, I can, comment more, they, they spent, I mean, there's a new on theory initiative is there for a reason. They spent uh, a lot of time understanding this, but it's true that they decided to ignore the BMW in the combination. Um, it, it was available a few months before. Uh, so this was, I think they put it out in January and the, 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 the the, G, the consensus number uh, was published in uh, summer 2020. But uh, I think what was done also makes sense. No, I don't know if you, are, you should uh, combine them. So I think it's like, I think plots like this now are very useful because you can now draw your own conclusions. The, the conclusion is that, um, is on the theory side, not everything is clear, I would say, no? Yeah, I agree. I mean, that, that, yeah. that seems to go through. Mm. Yeah. Maybe we, there is another question. Maybe we have time for a, a short one. Uh, it's uh, uh, Albert Durek. Yeah, hi, it's, it's, it's actually not a question, but uh, maybe some additional information very shortly. That is for the R ratios, which we said, like the ones measured in uh, LHCB. Uh, there is very good, uh, I would say, prospect that you would see some numbers coming out in a not too distant future from CMS, because in CMS took in 2018 a special run uh, with the for, for optimized uh, B selection as a special trigger. And these have these are being analyzed and that's ongoing since uh, two years in fact is this, this analysis and uh, i think soon you will hear or see some measurements so from an independent experiment on these uh, quantities and uh, I, i'm not going to predict when but but uh, in a not too distant future and I, I would imagine this year yeah i mean this the park data by cms that's definitely it's it, this would be fantastic i should have said this there's not just bear, but CMS would uh, really can weigh in. You're absolutely right. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. I, I think we are uh, uh, arriving in the time. Uh, um, it's already quite late. Uh, uh, th there is the still the option to post uh, some other questions for the speaker on the on the web page. And uh, if you're uh, is kind enough to to answer, if there are some uh, some questions in the forum. Uh, otherwise, uh, I thank again very much the, uh, the speaker, Yuri. Thanks for uh, giving this very nice talk and for the, for the discussion. And um, yeah, see you and then at the next colloquium.